Um, we will be moving forward with our last or second to last session for the day, Cancer and Palliative Care. Uh, I will be moderating the session. We will be starting with our first speaker, Ms. Lara. Um, uh, Ms. Lara Estaiti, I hope I didn't say your name wrong. Uh, obtained a Bachelor's of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics in 2012 from the American University of Beirut. She currently works as a clinical dietitian at Right Bite and has been working as a clinical dietitian for the past 11 years in clinical settings and hospital settings as well. She is passionate about educating patients on nutritional practices designed to prevent diseases and promote health. She has special interest in nutrition management of cancer patients, and her primary role was to work with multidisciplinary team to care for cancer patients and provide dietetic recommendations to help manage symptoms of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, as well as optimizing health through treatment and afterwards. Uh, thank you for joining us today. You may come on stage. Oh, hi. <laughs> So hello everyone, uh, thank you for your interest and for joining us. Thank you for the organization for the kind invitation. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I will talk to you about uh, key points about oncology nutrition, which is a subject very dear to me. So I will be presenting the current scientific guidelines on nutrition in cancer patients and how we can implement them into practice. So let us start. This work. Okay. This one? Oh, that, okay. Okay, thank you. So the outline of my presentation is as follows. I will go over the malnutrition screening and assessment. I will talk about the nutrition interventions during cancer therapy. And the final part of my presentation, I will go over the nutrition interventions in the palliative care and end of life patients. So I will start talking about malnutrition screening and assessment. Uh, so malnutrition, why is there always a fuss around malnutrition? As we know that malnutrition and loss of muscle mass are prevalent in cancer patients and can have a negative effect on clinical outcomes. Malnutrition can be driven by inadequate food intake, decreased physical activity, and the metabolic and catabolic derangement of cancer. So it has been estimated that the prevalence of malnutrition in cancer patients is about 40 to 80 percent and that 10 to 20 percent of cancer patients die due to the consequences of malnutrition rather than the tumor itself. This is why it's very crucial that all cancer patients be screened regularly for the risk or presence of malnutrition as nutrition plays a very crucial role in the cancer care. So. What are the validated screening tools to identify the risk of malnutrition? So the Academy is Evidence Analysis Library identified the following four tools to be, to be valid and reliable for use in the outpatient and inpatient cancer setting. So these are the PGSGA or the Patient Generated Subjective, Subjective Global Assessment, the MST tool or the Malnutrition Screening Tool, the MSTC, which is the Malnutrition Screening Tool for Cancer Patients, and the MUST, which is the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool. So if we take the example of the MST, which is the tool that uh, I used to use back in my practice when I was practicing in the hospital. So the MST tool is a very easy, quick, and reliable tool to use in cancer patients. It includes questions about recent weight loss and uh, decreased food intake due to decreased appetite. So the sum of these two questions will give us a score between one and five. So if the score is more than or equal to two, this means that our patient is at risk of malnutrition and needs our prompt nutrition assessment and intervention. Uh, so yeah. So what are the characteristics to support the diagnosis of adult malnutrition? So we have the insufficient energy intake, weight loss, loss of muscle mass, loss of subcutaneous fat, edema, and diminished functional status as measured by the hand grip strength. 
So the identification of two or more of the following six characteristics will identify if the patient is malnourished or not. If you notice that the serum proteins such as albumin and prealbumin are not included as defining characteristics of malnutrition as these proteins do not, do not change in response to changes in nutrition intake. So how can we assess energy intake in our cancer patients? And how can we assess if they are malnourished or no? So if we take malnutrition in the context, in the context of acute illness, if our patient is eating less than 75% of their estimated needs for more than seven days, or if they're meeting less than or equal to 50% of their energy requirements for more than or equal to five days, this means that our patient fulfills one of the characteristics of being malnourished. As for the interpretation of weight loss, if our patient lost uh, one to 2% of his weight in one week, or more than 2% of his weight in one week, this means that our patient is either moderately malnourished or severely malnourished. As for the identification of fat loss, muscle loss, and fluid accumulation, here we need to perform a physical exam. So we need to perform a physical exam and document any of the following findings as an indicator of malnutrition. So for example, for the loss of body fat, we can examine the areas around the eye, which is the orbital area or the triceps or the fat underlying the ribs. As for the muscle uh, loss, we can examine, for example, the deltoid muscle, and I will talk, uh, I will give examples shortly. So in order to assess body fat loss, if we take the example of the orbital region, which is the region surrounding the eye, in the cases of moderate malnutrition or severe malnutrition, we can see that the patient would have slightly dark circles and a hollow look or dep depression under his eyes. And here are examples of uh, moderately malnourished patients and severely malnourished patients. As we can see the dark circles and the hollow look under their eyes. As for the assessment of muscle mass, uh, we can examine the deltoid muscle. In the cases of moderate malnutrition, we can see that the bone is slightly protruded. As for the case in severe malnutrition, we can see that the protrusion is very prominent, just as in the case of this picture. So the first two pictures are in the cases of moderate malnutrition, where we see the bone, the deltoid muscle slightly protruded. As for the case in the severe malnutrition, we can see that the bone is uh, severely protruded. So what about multivitamin and mineral supplement? Do you think that we should provide all our cancer patients multivitamin and mineral supplements routinely to all of these patients? Well, um, as we know that almost 50% of cancer patients rely on alternative and complementary medical products coming from multivitamin or mineral supplementations. However, several studies have found that supplementing with multivitamin and mineral supplement supplementation had no effect on cancer incidence. This is why the recommendation includes that vitamins and minerals be supplemented in amounts approximately equal to the RDA and to discourage the use of high dose supplementation in the absence of specific deficiencies. So moving on to the next part of my presentation, which is the nutrition interventions during cancer therapy. So what are the protein and energy needs of our cancer patients? So as for the energy needs, it's been estimated to be around 25 to 30 calorie per kilo per day. As for the protein needs, it's estimated to be about 1 to 1.5 gram per kilo per day. But for patients with acute or chronic kidney disease, uh, their protein supply should not exceed 1 or 1.2 gram per kilo per day. So moving on to oral nutrition, as we know, adequate nutrition is very vital for our cancer patients and nutrition therapy should always be initiated when our patients are not yet severely malnourished. Uh, the first form of nutrition support should always be nutrition counseling to help them manage their symptoms and to encourage the intake of high protein and energy dense foods. Uh, the use of oral nutrition supplements is advised when our patients are not being able to meet their energy needs and protein needs with the enriched diet that is high in protein and high in calories. Medical nutrition 
which is the initiation of enteral or parental nutrition, is only indicated if our patients are unable to eat adequately. And by that, we mean if they're eating less than 50% of their requirement for more than one week, or if they're meeting 50 to 75% of their requirement for more than two weeks. So let us talk about enteral and parental nutrition. So if the decision has been made to feed our patient, we definitely recommend enteral over parental nutrition. If oral intake remains inadequate, despite our nutrition counseling, providing them a nutrition supplement, and we only recommend parental nutrition if enteral nutrition is not sufficient or feasible. And this is in the case of chronic bowel obstruction, intestinal insufficiency, ileus, or intractable vomiting. If oral intake, we have to be very careful, if oral intake has been decreased severely for a prolonged period of time, we recommend to increase oral, enteral, or parenteral nutrition only slowly uh, over several days and to take additional precautions to prevent refeeding syndrome, which was Briefly, uh, we went over that in the previous sessions. So if you can talk about refeeding syndrome a bit, it's the metabolic and physiologic effects seen when a patient is fed too aggressively after being in a state of semi-starvation or if the patient has been severely malnourished. So the consequences of refeeding syndrome include glucose and fluid intolerance, hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, and hypomagnesemia. So how can we prevent or treat refeeding syndrome? Uh, it is very crucial to check serum potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus before feeding initiation. It is very, it's also very important to administer thiamine in daily doses of 200 to 300 milligrams, as well as a balanced micronutrient mixture before feeding. Uh, we need to initiate the feeding very slowly and very gradually over a period of several days. We, initi we can initiate with 10 to 20 calories per kilo, but in the cases of severe patients that are at high risk, we start at 5 calories per kilo, and we advance by 33% of goal every one to two days. And we definitely need to monitor and substitute the electrolytes when it comes to potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. So what about the ketogenic diet? I'm sure a lot of you heard about the ketogenic diet and its effect on cancer patients, as there has been a hype around the ketogenic diet and its effect on tumor growth. So as we know, there are no diets known to reproducibly cure cancer, uh, and there are no clinical trials demonstrating a benefit of a ketogenic diet in cancer patients. Also due to their low palatability, uh, ketogenic diets may lead to insufficient energy intake and weight loss. This is why we do not recommend the use of dietary provisions that restrict energy intake in patients with or at risk of malnutrition. Exercise, as we know that nutritional care should always be accompanied by exercise training. This can consist of supervised or home-based moderate intensity training about three sessions per week, 10 to 60 minutes per session. Sometimes these uh, recommendations can include uh, motivating patients to take a daily walk in order to reduce the risk of atrophy due to inactivity. And the best type of exercise is definitely the both aerobic and resistance training. But as we know from our everyday practice, we don't see patients engaging in exercise. And sometimes it is very hard to motivate them to do so because of the debilitating side effects of the treatment. So what would be nice to work on is to encourage hospitals to come up with an easy exercise program and implement it at a hospital level so that our patients would be motivated to do these easy exercise regimens. Moving on to the nutrition interventions related to patients receiving chemotherapy. So as we know, chemotherapy has a lot of debilitating nutritional side effects, including weight loss, decreased appetite, decreased uh, food intake, taste alterations, mucos mucositis, and many others. So how can we help patients 
suffering from these side effects. So if we have a patient uh, suffering from weight loss and decreased appetite, what we do is that we encourage them to have small frequent meals, high in energy and high in protein, such as um, yogurt, milkshakes, uh, and foods that are high in energy. We also advise them on high caloric beverages. Uh, we advise them to increase their intake of their preferred food, and we advise them not to drink uh, while eating. And we can definitely advise them on oral nutrition supplement if they're not able to meet their needs from the food alone. What about taste alterations? We usually advise them to avoid using metallic utensils and to use plastic utensils instead if they're having that metallic taste. We also advise them to avoid red meat if they're being annoyed from the red meat and to substitute it with chicken or fish or cheeses or eggs. We also advise them to add spices and sauces to their food and to use tart flavors such as lemon wedges, citrus fruits, or vinegar. And we definitely advise them to avoid canned food items and to use fresh or frozen uh, fruits and vegetables instead. What about mucositis? So we definitely advise them on easy to chew and swallow foods, such as scrambled eggs, blended vegetables, potato puree. Uh, we also advise them to avoid acidic or citrus foods and beverages, such as tomato sauce, definitely also spicy food. Uh, we also advise them to avoid hard food items, such as toast, crackers, raw vegetables, because this can irritate their ulcers more. And we also advise them to have the food at room temperature and to avoid having the food too hot because this can also make their uh, pain worse. Uh, what about the nutrition interventions related to patients undergoing radiotherapy? So uh, radiotherapy to the head and neck or the esophagus induces mucositis, decreased food intake and weight loss in about 80% of our patients. Similarly, the radiotherapy to the pelvic region is associated with GI symptoms in about 80% of our patients. This is why uh, all patients undergoing radiotherapy to the, to the GI tract or the head and neck region should definitely receive thorough nutrition assessment and adequate nutrition counseling. Neutropenic diet is the diet that we usually prescribe to our patients who are neutropenic or have a low immunity. And this includes avoiding raw fruits and vegetables to uh, prevent foodborne infections. But what is the research behind the neutropenic diet? Uh, there are insufficient consistent clinical data to recommend a low bacterial diet for patients more than 30 days after allogenic transplantation. So the emerging practice now is to emphasize strict adherence to food safety guidelines when it comes to frequent hand washing and practicing safe uh, food safety steps when it comes to preparing the food, uh, shopping for the food, storing, cooking, thawing. The last part of my presentation is the nutrition intervention in the palliative care setting. So what do you think? Do you think that we should screen and assess these patients in the palliative care setting? What do you think? Not necessarily. Well, the answer is definitely yes. Why is that? Because patients with advanced cancers can have a life expectancy of several months to several years, which is a time frame over which any patient would have succumbed to starvation. This is why deficits in nutritional status may also impair their performance status, their quality of life, their tolerance to anti-cancer treatments and survival. So yes, it is recommended to proceed with screening and assessments in patients with advanced cancer. Now the question is how aggressive can we go with these patients? So the benefits of nutritional support in patients with advanced cancer should be carefully considered, taking into account several factors with the expected survival being the most important factor to consider. So if the expected survival of our cancer patients is between several months or several years, then yes, nutrition therapy should definitely be given, whether it's oral, enteral, or parenteral. If expected survival is in the range of few to several weeks, then nutrition interventions should be non-invasive and primarily focused 
at psychosocial and existential support. As for the nutrition and the end, at the end of life, in dying patients, we recommend that treatment be based on comfort because there is little or no benefit from nutritional support in the last weeks of life. Hunger is very rare in dying patients and sometimes normal amounts of food or fluid can have a negative effect on our patients and can induce metabolic distress. However, as we know from our practice, we see a lot of the family members, caregivers demanding nutrition support. As we know that food has an emotional, existential, and uh, it's, it's, it's social significance. So it's sometimes very hard to uh, explain to the family that the goals of care is comfort and that sometimes this food can really harm the patient rather than doing him good. Hydration, so routine hydration at the end of life showed no improvement on symptoms and quality of life. And parenteral hydration should not be used for thirst palliation or mouth dryness because oral care measures are effective to comfort these patients. So these are my references. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you for that very interesting presentation. Our next speaker who will be joining us virtually, uh, Dr. Ibtissam Ahmed, uh, clinical professor for the Department of Clinical Health Professions at St. John's University College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in New York, United States of America. In conjugation with her faculty appointment, she is a clinical pharmacist at the Supportive Oncology Clinic, Vermont Sinai Medical Center, Department of Geriatric and Palliative Care. She earned her doctorate in pharmacy from St. George University and completed a postgraduate pharmacy residency at the University of California, San Francisco. Holding a master's degree in bioethics from Columbia University, she is a board certified medication therapy management specialist and a Fulbright specialist scholar. Dr. Ahmed is a member of the Regional Expert Network on Palliative Care, WHO, Eastern Mediterranean Region Office, and the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Dr. Thank you very Ahmed. much. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, the committee for inviting me to speak about nutrition in patients receiving cancer treatment, and thank you for the introduction. So I am going to present a lot of what Lara presented as well. However, I'm going to spin it a little bit because I was a cancer patient myself uh, up to a year ago. So I'm going to share my own personal experience being a cancer patient who was malnourished due to cancer treatment and cancer chemotherapy and how this affected me and what kind of methodology and what kind of effective measures that the palliative care team and my oncology services team helped me to cope with the disease itself. So um, just to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just a little bit of, you're going to see a lot of my slides overlap with the previous speaker. So we all know that cancer and cancer treatment can cause malnutrition like we just heard right now. And it can cause uh, different effects. So in my own experience, I recall the days when I would get chemotherapy and the first, first few days, uh, probably from day one until day five, there was a lot of like that lack of interest in having any kind of food. There was a lot of like that smell, anything would trigger a lot of nausea in my case. There was also this ability in even to maintain whatever food I was eating. There was a lot of nausea and vomiting associated with it. And there was significantly, I was experiencing a lot of fatigue, a lot of tiredness. Um, also, it significantly also affected my mood in the sense that I was um, pretty much most of the time sitting in bed. I don't want to talk to my family. I don't want to talk to anybody. I was very anxious. I was in a lot of pain from the chemotherapy. So it was pretty much multifactorial. So I would say that it definitely affected my overall quality of life. So just um, to quickly talk about cachexia in general, just to give some definitions for what cachexia is in cancer patient population. 
So cachexia is a condition that is um, marked by a weakness in weight loss and fat and muscle loss. Um, it cannot be fully reversed by conventional nutritional supports. And we see this very commonly in cancer patients, especially patients who have any type of a GI tumor. So any type of a stomach tumor, any type of head and neck cancer patients as well. And it's pretty much has to do a lot with the negative protein and energy balance that is driven by a variable combination of reduced food. So either the patients themselves, and then in my case, this ability, inability to actually intake, and also there was a lot of abnormal metabolic pathways that were going on. So when we look at the faces of cachexia, cachexia has different faces. Uh, one could be the pre cachexia phase in which patients, like in my case, I was getting some chemotherapy, it was affecting me, it was causing me to have weight loss, it was causing me to have nausea, it was causing me to have vomiting, it was causing me to have loss of appetite. And then patient can progress and go into complete cachexia, where you can see a metabolic change in addition to the reduced fuel intake. And unfortunately, if patients, their cancer, which luckily is not my case, patient progress and go into advanced cancer, refractory cancer, and then we can see more of a refractory cachexia, which at this point becomes irreversible. So when we think about why this is happening in the cancer patient population, the exact mechanism of why cachexia in cancer happened is not fully understood. However, it's thought that it's to be related, it's multifactorial process. It has to do with a combination of tumor-related factor, systemic inflammation that's going on, tumor-related factor or a metabolic dysregulation. So the cancer itself um, produces a lot of inflammatory cytokines by the tumors and the immune system, such as interleukin-6, uh, tumor necrosis factors, uh, uh, interferon gamma, which causes muscle wastings and loss of appetite. And also there's some type of a disrupting normal metabolic pathways. In addition, also the tumor itself may secrete factors that directly affect the muscle and the fat metabolisms, such as mysostatin, which inhibits muscle growth and also regulates the fat metabolism. And this uh, breakdown of muscle and fat tissue releases a lot of amino acids, fatty acids, and other metabolic, metabolic, metabolites into the bloodstream, which can also contribute to the metabolic dysregulation. So the impact of cancer, uh, the impact of malnutrition or symptoms on cancer patients. So in my case, I again, I recall the days when I would get chemotherapy. The first thing that would happen usually is usually a day after the chemotherapy. From my own experience, I would not want to eat at all. That was the very common first that symptom that I experienced. This complete loss of appetite even comes to the point of water. I wouldn't even be drinking water like it would just cause a lot of like GI irritation for me in my case. Or if I were to try to eat by day two or day three, I would very easily and quickly get enough. Like I feel like, okay, that's it. I don't want to eat anymore. Also, depending on the type of chemotherapy, some patients might experience constipation, some might experience diarrhea. So in my case, where I received paclitaxel and carboplatin, I was unfortunately experiencing a lot of constipation secondary to the chemotherapy, which was hard to treat in many ways because I didn't want to drink water. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to be mobile. I didn't want to improve my GI motility by like like we like the previous speaker said, like encouraging patients to exercise or move. It was also debilitating because of the chemotherapy. I was in a lot of pain. The constipation was causing me to be in pain. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to drink. So I felt a lot that it was a vicious cycle. Like I was going around in circles for the very first five days of getting chemotherapy. But some other patients might experience diarrhea if they were to receive like other type of chemotherapy like erinitocan, for example. I was also, um, I also developed um, mucositis, unfortunately, also the, because of the chemotherapy where I would get these mouth sores that even drinking anything like um, cold or warm or um, even body temperature water, it would cause this like irritation in my oral mucosa. That was very like um, also a very cumbersome symptom for me. Also altering my taste and smell. Definitely I had a lot of like my taste, I think everything t tasted metallic in the first few days. 
um, and like our previous speaker mentioned, um, in the beginning, I was not aware that I shouldn't be using like utensils that are made out of metal because that really also um, made me have made the taste very worse. Um, and then definitely the fatigue, like, you know, being malnourished, I was very, very tired all the time. It was very hard for me to even go to the bathroom on my own. I needed a lot of like physical help. Like I needed someone to actually like escort me to go to the bathroom. And we definitely experienced a lot of also nausea because of the chemotherapy and because of the pain and because of the constipation. One of the things that um, definitely did help me a lot during my journey is from the minute I was diagnosed, I asked for palliative care services. So in the United States, and that should be really the model that we should advocate for palliative care for very early on. We shouldn't wait for patients to become advanced cancer or to become metastatic disease. Is from the minute you make a diagnosis of cancer, patients, and in my case, I really benefited from a palliative care referral. And the palliative care team referred me to work with a nutritionist who, from the second cycle of chemotherapy, we met, she assessed me, she took a number of measures, we talked about what I like to eat, what I don't to eat, she gave me some, phys some feedback. She also talked to my family because they were very stressed out about the fact that I was not eating and drinking, especially in the first few days of chemotherapy. So palliative care, early, inter early intervention and providing palliative care could really help improve the overall quality of life. But when we think about patients who are malnourished, and in my case, because of the fact that I wasn't really moving out of bed, there was a lot of limitation when it came to my physical activity. So I definitely significantly lost a lot of muscle tissues, unfortunately, during my cancer treatment. Also, one of the things that I noticed because I was not eating and drinking as much and I was not getting out of bed as much that, and because of that persistent fatigue, my concentration was very limited. It was very hard for me to focus on something, even as simple as like reading like one page or even watching a TV show. My mood definitely got affected by this whole malnutrition and this whole like cancer chemotherapy in general. Um, I was very um, anxious at the time. I was very worried because I was also seeing like I was losing rapidly a lot of weight. And also, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this tendency that I had to isolate myself, like I just wanted to not interact with my family as much, tended more to be in bed most of the time. And I felt also it, this malnutrition also gave a lot of stress to my own family where they were very worried about me in the sense of like, she's not eating, she's not drinking, she's losing weight. And the fact this vicious cycle in my head also that I recall, I was so worried every time I would go to my cancer chemotherapy treatment because I was so worried that they would hold the chemotherapy and they would say, oh my God, you're losing so much weight. Like there is a point where you know what, like now we're going to have to intervene, give you like a TPN or give you like um, internal nutrition and so on. So I was doing as much as I can, but there were days that were very hard. That was really like very difficult to even like eat and drink and also the stress again from my family. So that it was like, I felt like I was in a vicious cycle of trying to like help myself, but on the same time worried about the people around me. So I recall from the days when I met with the dietitian. Uh, after the referral from the palliative care, the first thing that she did, she did an objective measures, uh, like we heard from our previous speaker. She did a measurement of body weight, uh, did a complete assessment using uh, the different tools that we heard from our previous speakers again. She also did a subjective measures using like one of the malnutrition assessment tools. Uh, we didn't do much uh, laboratory measures because I was not like hypoalbuminemic, and again, they are very rarely used in clinical practice. And like our previous speaker mentioned, there are a number of tools out there um, that were used. In my case, we in my case we used the patient-generated subjective global assessment. Um, that was very good in my case, uh, where she uh, evaluated it combined uh, a number of subjective and objective assessment to evaluate my own nutrition status. Uh, so she asked me about like my medical history. She asked me about my physical examination. She did a physical examination. She asked me about like what I like to eat, if I'm taking any supplements. And supplements was very important because some supplements, she actually made me stop. Like I recall taking like omega-3 and I was taking um, St. John's Ward and she made me stop these supplements because they actually interact with the chemotherapy as well. So it's very important also to ask as uh, not only clinicians, as oncologists or palliative care specialists to ask patients about whatever supplements they are taking. 
um, she also asked me about like um, if anything would trigger more of like um, my symptoms and the sense I also had IBS prior going into cancer, uh, irritable bowel syndrome disease. So I was having a lot of like abdominal pain prior even to the whole cancer diagnosis. So she also was working with me in the sense like what triggered the IBS, like what they like what happened and what food would trigger the IBS attack. So she made sure that while I was undergoing my cancer chemotherapy is to avoid anything that would aggravate or would cause any IBS attack. And uh, just to mention, you can use any of these tools. Uh, there is no single one that has been universally agreed. Uh, it all depends on what the patients and it all depends on like what the dietitian or the nutritionist, nutritionist have an experience with. Also, to um, uh, unfortunately, and this is um, it's a fortunate and unfortunate. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of patients, because weight loss is often a silent symptoms rather than patients who are in pain, because we are you can verbally communicate more the fact that you are in pain or you're having like shortness of breath, versus weight loss is more of like a silent symptoms. But the fortunate part in my case, because I was a palliative care specialist and I still am. And because I worked in palliative care, I was able to ask early on for palliative care and for a dietitian and for nutrition to come and help me to improve my overall quality of life and to make sure that I'm doing well to make sure I finish my chemotherapy. So some of the um, methods of nutrition therapy, like we heard again from the previous speaker, is to provide the intervention as early as possible. So don't wait until patients are later on the game or patients are like by cycle three or four or five or six of their chemotherapy. From the minute they get diagnosed, they should be assessed. They should be counseled about what to do about their nutrition in case intake, like in my case. Um, the evidence-based recommendations and the guidelines, I'm not going to go over because our previous speaker went over this. And again, to work with a registered dietitian or nutritionist to improve and maintain the optimal nutrition status and the overall quality of life. So some of the behavior strategies, and I like the word behavior because it really had to do a lot with like how you reframe your brain and how you think about like how you can do better. Some, so some of the things that worked in my case and like a lot of them actually our previous speaker talked about is to, and it was really encouraged in my own case. Like I recall my nutritionist telling me all the time, I don't want you to be focused on like eating large meals. I just want you to have small frequent meals that are high in protein and calories throughout the day. So as simple as like by day four, usually when I started to feel like, okay, I could manage now, I could eat something a little bit. She would tell me, for example, to eat like, you know, chicken if I can, to eat like um, uh, peanut butter, like a spoon of peanut butter if I can, because that's high, like high protein. And she said to focus more on like high dense food rather than like eating very, very frequently. And also the social benefit of eating with eating with others, because, you know, I was very sad most of the time. I was very anxious. I was worried about, am I going to finish the chemotherapy? Am I going to relapse? And so on that um, I developed, unfortunately, a lot of anxiety. However, she really emphasized a lot of the time that I should be eating with somebody, especially if it's my family member. Uh, so I actually took it upon myself, like by day five, when I was starting to feel, okay, I would tell my sister, like, hey, can you come over a little bit? And like, let's just try to eat a little bit together. So that actually, like, I would feel like at least I'm not alone all the time. I'm not in isolation. Also preparing food. Um, I liked a lot of, I, I'm not a, I'm really a book, I, I, um, I'm not really like a big cook. However, you know, when the COVID pandemic happened, it kind of forced me to learn how to cook. So by day six and seven, I recall um, when I would, after I would like get some of my energy back from the chemotherapy, like I would actually make my own food and things that I like to cook for myself. And they give me pleasure. The fact that I'm able to stand and in fact, I'm able to like do something for myself. And as far as the constipation, that was like one of the very common symptoms that I developed is uh, she tried to encourage me like, you know, to take little walks throughout my apartment by day three or four or whatever. I had the energy just to be able to be mobile, to eat like high fiber meals if I can, and to also drink like hot liquids or to drink like water, but not in large quantity. She encouraged like small quantity or drinking plenty of fluid throughout the day. And as far as like the mouth sores, um, she encouraged me to also um eat very easy to chew foods. So like we heard like scrambled eggs or like cut the food. If I would eat a boiled egg, she would tell me to cut it into small little pieces. 
Um, I personally like a, a lot of like Asian fusion and Indian food. However, the smell was very triggering for me. That it, it would make me like very nauseous. She would, she would encourage me to avoid doing that while I was on, undergoing my cancer chemotherapy treatment. She also um, recommended for me to use like smaller spoon, like made out of wood. And that definitely does help me a lot with like my taste. And also as far as Janagia to eat, like especially in the very few, few days to eat like blend food, easy, easy to digest meals, to eat like um, dry or suck on hard candy, like ginger actually, um, it came in like a chewable candy that was very, very helpful for me with the nausea, especially in the very few days. And if I was to happen to vomit, which luckily didn't happen that much, nausea happened more in my case, is to try to drink small amount of liquid. And also she would tell me to get like uh, one of those electrolyte drinks like Gatorade or one of those, um, or eat a banana and cut it very small. So kind of like replenish like whatever, if I would happen to vomit, replenish whatever I was losing. So the treatment approach really is um, pretty much is optimized based on the patient uh, and the contributing factors. It's not one size fits all. That's why we really need nutrition and dietitians to come on board. And by involving also the patient's family, they should also be in, uh, counseled. And that happened in my own case, um, that telling patients, uh, telling their families, like, you know, I remember the nutritionist meeting with me and my sister and telling her, like, don't force food upon her. Don't, like, try to, like, make her feel guilty about not eating as much. Don't make her feel guilty about losing weight. Just be patient with her. Understand like, you know, this is part of like her illnesses that she, you know, part of like her treatment plan is going to make her feel sick a little bit. It's going to make her feel nauseous. But once she finishes treatment, she will go back to normal. So involving the family is just very important as well. And I'm not going to talk about this. Just this is more like advanced cancers. This is not really my case, luckily. Um, that, you know, there's no evidence that artificial nutrition, including like hyper eliminations, prolongs life. And we'll hear more about end of life care uh, in the next speaker by Dr. Neil, who's going to talk about what do we do in these difficult situations where we have end of life care patients and we have family members who are very adamant about feeding their loved ones. So in conclusion, malnutrition is a very common complication of cancer that could definitely um, and in my case, ne neg negatively impacted my overall health and my quality of life. However, early identifications and interventions can really help and prevent malnutrition in cancer patients. And uh, treatment approaches for malnutrition in cancer patients depend, again, on the severity of how malnourished the patient is, the underlying cause, the overall patient status, and the overall prognosis. Uh, it needs a multidisciplinary approach, which can develop and implement an effective treatment plan to each patient so it's tailored around the patient and their caregiver and can definitely significantly improve outcomes and the overall quality of life for cancer patients. Thank you so much for listening to me and thank you for hearing my story. And I will stay around till we come to the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sam, for that wonderful presentation. Our last speaker for this session is Dr. Neil. Uh, Dr. Neil is a UK-trained consultant in palliative medicine at Burjil Medical City. Uh, after medical school at King's College London, he pursued specialty training in palliative medicine and previously worked as a consultant in palliative medicine at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust in London where he was the clinical lead for palliative medicine. He has over 10 years of clinical experience in palliative medicine, and he is the first licensed palliative care physician in Abu Dhabi and is licensed to practice all aspects of palliative medicine. He strongly believes that for all patients, if once symptoms are well controlled, they will feel better, and both the patient and their family will tolerate their medical treatments better. Thank you, Dr. Neil, for being with us today. Is it okay? Which which one is forward? Sweet. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, just adjust this. Everybody can hear me. Okay. Um, uh, a big thank you to the organizers for inviting me yet again, um, and well done to the organizers uh, because last year I was the only one talking about end of life care, and uh, this afternoon this been full of end of life care. So actually, I'm going to flick through my slides incredibly quickly because. 
Lara and Eptisan have done a lot of the work for me. So, um, nutritional support at the end of life. I think with all the palliative care education that we do, um, the words that we use are really, really important. Palliative care is a specialty that focuses on improving the quality of life of patients, irregardless of the stage of their disease. So it's really, really important to say that uh, palliative care is not just for patients at the end of life. Mm -hmm. end -stage cancer, end-stage heart failure, somebody with end-stage dementia. Yes, palliative care has a role to play there, but I spend maybe 50% of my time uh, working with the multidisciplinary team uh, in patients who have curative cancer, for example. I may see that patient once or twice and never again. So palliative care is based on need. It's not based on diagnosis. So thank you to everybody for, for touching on palliative and end-of-life care so well, so I can just focus on the scenarios. So I, I want to give you three common scenarios that I spend a lot of time uh, dealing with in my day-to-day -day work. So we're going to flick through these quite quickly. So frail 65-year-old gentleman, advanced colon cancer, last anti-cancer treatment was about six months ago. He's frail, bed-bound, but he's not in any pain. And again, as for the patient, for the family, the appetite's been gradually going down for the past four or five months. He's drinking very, very small amounts of water, juice, bit of laban, but nothing solid, and he's happy like that. He's now been admitted to the hospital because he hasn't had anything to eat or drink for a few days now. His blood tests are normal, completely plumb normal. These are real cases. But the family are completely distraught. Look how weak he is. He's not eating anything. You've got to give him something to stimulate his appetite. And if you don't feed him, he's going to die. What are you going to do about it? I get at least one of these a month. That's case one. Uh, case two, you, you, most of the people who work in a hospital will recognize this. Very, very advanced age lady, advanced dementia. Uh, this lady had frontotemporal dementia for about six, seven years, minimally communicative, barely responsive, doesn't recognize anybody. Um, Pain-free, and she looks actually quite comfortable. Her appetite had been going down for the past six months. And typically, uh, every time she had something orally, uh, she started to cough. And she's sleeping pretty much 24 hours a day. Again, she was admitted to the hospital because of no oral intake for a couple of weeks now. She's a little bit dehydrated, uh, urea and creatinine slightly elevated, but actually blood tests are fairly, fairly normal. She's a little bit hypotensive, but she's not tachycardic. And again, the family are incredibly distraught. Uh, you have to put a feeding tube into her. So again, very common scenario. And then this is increasingly common. Um, I first saw this case as a trainee in London, uh, and I've had a couple of cases here. Uh, a 45-year-old gentleman uh, with four kids under the age of 12, really advanced gastric cancer, uh, inoperable cancer, some response to anti-cancer treatment, but then progressed. By the time he came into hospital and we got involved, he had a venting gastrostomy, uh, which allowed his proximal GI contents to come out. He had an inoperable small bowel uh, um, obstruction, um, and they had stopped all anti-cancer treatment. He was hungry all the time, didn't want TPN, was very clear about that, looked really well. You could not tell this gentleman had cancer, or for that matter, a very, very advanced malignancy. So the question was how to support this man nutritionally, and we are getting much more of this now. So... Why do we spend so much time talking about food? So this is Maslow's hierarchy of need in the triangle. And food's at the bottom. I know we have modern versions of this with Wi-Fi. sorry, with Wi-Fi as well, but let's focus on the food. Uh, there is a version of chicken soup in every culture because food is so intrinsically important to humanity. This is why when our loved ones are sick, we try to feed them better. When somebody is sick, you go to the house, you bring food. And I've worked in a couple of places around the world. Every culture does this. So, so there is something significant uh, to humans about food. And the end of life is a very, very particular phase in life. Um, and the rules change at the end of life. Uh, the body isn't working normally. Physiology is not behaving normally. And so when we talk about end of life for the purposes of this presentation, I'm talking about a patient for whom we've recognized that they are dying, they are coming to the end of life, and then it's the last couple of days or weeks of life. Again, we've talked about the type of patients, it's not necessarily limited to cancer, 
and again, a lot of people have touched on this today. So when we are approaching the end of life, whatever the cause, there is inevitably a reduction in appetite. Uh, the amount of calories, the amount of the different food groups that we need reduces. Effectively, the body is in the phase of shutting down. Therefore, the amount of energy required and expenditure goes down. Therefore, the need for calories is also going down. And this lack of desire for food or appetite that we call anorexia, it's really, really hard for families to, to understand. Because normally you feed somebody better when they're unwell, if they have the cold, if they have the flu, you give them food. In this situation, food will not turn things around. And that makes families feel really, really uh, unsatisfied. So, again, I was going to talk, touch on, on signs of approaching death, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to do that. So we know that somebody who is recognized to be dying, their needs for food and drink are much less. Um, Laura's already touched on this. After Sam has touched on this. The body simply can't tolerate that volume of calories and, and, and just the volume of food. So you need much less. We've touched on why it's difficult for family members. And everybody knows what the different forms of artificial nutrition and hydration there are. Um, the language, the language, the language, how we say things is really, really important. Everybody will have encountered patients and families who say, look, they're starving to death. You're not feeding them. Patients who are dying naturally, whether they're dying from heart failure, multi-organ failure, advanced cancer, they are not starving. Starvation is suffering or extreme end. Death caused from a lack of food. You're actively denying the patient food. The patient who's dying, they're not starving. They simply don't need as much food. So this is what we mean when we say the rules are different to the end of life. And one of my, my trainees is, as, a, as a very, very junior doctor, I, I had the fortune to work with palliative care a long, long time ago. Maybe that's why I ended up being a palliative care doctor. I don't know. But you know, I, I saw her have a conversation with relatives, and, and they did the usual thing. Listen, look, they're, they're dying because they're not eating and drinking. And this was somebody who had end-stage dementia, um, mute, uh, unresponsive, minimal uh, interaction with the environment around them. And actually, her terminology explaining it to the family was so good. She goes, it's, it's not that they're dying because they're not eating and drinking. You know, they're not eating and drinking because this is part of the dying process. So the language that we use is incredibly important. And I spend 90% of my time with families uh, talking about the language, the words we use. Um, and it's important because the more distressed the family gets, the more distressing the language gets, and that drives the distress in the environment that the patient is cared for. Again, thank you so much. Everybody who has already touched on this, you know, artificial nutrition and hydration will not rapidly turn things around. That's simply not possible. Um, there's been a lot of work looking at uh, the impact of uh, IV fluids, particularly on patient perception of thirst. There is no evidence that giving patients tons and tons of IV fluid addresses their thirst. We have very good evidence from patients in, in ICU setting that as much IV fluid as a patient can tolerate before you overload them does nothing for thirst. The thing that makes it different for thirst is good mouth care and oral moisture. Yes, there are oral gels, artificial salivas, but there is no evidence that these things are any better than putting something into the mouth. So my patients say to me, doc, I just want to drink juice. I just want to have a G&T if they drink alcohol. I said, have it. And the family said, why are you not giving them the gels? I said, there's no enjoyment in these gels. The rate at which you have to apply them and put them into the mouth is so frequent as to be onerous and burdensome. So it has to be balanced as per what the patient wants. So as much as we spend time looking at blood tests and scans, especially towards the end of life, I spend as much time sitting down and asking the patient if the family lets me, well, what do you want? What's most important? It's very difficult to have that conversation if the family have not allowed the patient to speak openly, or if the patient has not really been having ownership of, of their condition, if the family have consented for chemotherapy, the family signs the consent form, and we only come in at the end stage of life, it's very difficult to change that dynamic. So I have to spend huge amounts of time explaining to the family why I need to speak openly and honestly to that patient. Now, 
I'm going to flick through this very, very quickly. You're very welcome to have the, the slides. The evidence for artificial nutrition and hydration at the end of life is very poor, extremely poor. Why? Uh, this is not simply a case of a lack of evidence, meaning that there's no benefit. It's just really, really difficult to pin down a group of patients that are dying. Dying is a very heterogeneous group of uh, diagnoses. So it's almost impossible to do a randomized control trial of patients who are dying from, say, an advanced cancer, because every cancer is different, versus patients who are dying from something else. It's never going to happen. Um, we know that enteral feeding does help. Uh, if you get the feeding into the patient, uh, before they've entered that stage of irreversible cachexia. And yes, uh, enteral feeding does keep patients alive longer. Question is, how does it help their quality of life? And that's where the problem uh, comes. In the UK, our approach to patients who are very clearly at the end of life is different. Uh, not because the culture is that different, but because patients have access to palliative care at a much earlier stage. So you've built that relationship, you've explained to the families, you've addressed those fears so that they're prepared generally for when end of life is happening. If you haven't had that, um, these patients do get enteral tubes. It keeps them alive longer. And what I'm seeing now is I'm seeing patients who despite having all the calories that the dietitians and the nutrition team say is required, they're still losing weight the integrity of their skin starts to deteriorate and we end up making that patient suffer more. I have seen more patients suffering uh, with discomfort from damaged skin, despite having optimal nursing care and optimal nutrition. Medicine is very, very good at keeping people alive much longer now. Uh, the problem is when the patient is dying and we interfere with that natural process, uh, the body doesn't behave normally. And then we end up chasing our tail, trying to fix things that are not fixable. And in doing that, we end up making patients suffer more. And I am seeing this. As long as you've got a good relationship with the patient's family, you can steer them the right directions, but there is still a lot of resistance. Um, a lot of people have touched on this. Uh, excessive amounts of fluid at the end of life will tip patients into pulmonary edema. I, I'm not going to go through these. Um, Lara's already touched on, on, on dry mouth. Uh, so pragmatically, how, how do you deal with um, the need or the want to give people food at the end of life? Well, it depends on the case. Each case is different. So some of my colleagues in hospital say to me, we've not met a palliative care doctor like you who gives TPN or who gives IV fluid. Even when I started palliative care training in 2010, from then to now, things have changed. Um, and I will say this, uh, when I started training and my first palliative care job was in a hospice, uh, they didn't put patients on IV fluids or subcutaneous fluids. And I remember the first month that I was working there, I was on call on a bank holiday weekend, so four days. And a 25-year-old lady with very, very advanced breast cancer, very rare breast cancer, got admitted to the hospital, to the hospice, delirious, really agitated, unsettled. Um, the family really didn't want to do any blood tests. Consultant at the time said, no, we're not doing blood tests. It's not appropriate. And so I disagreed with my boss at the time. And I said to the family, I said, uh, you know her best. Uh, when was she last herself? She goes, well, beginning of the week, she was well. She was up about walking. So I said, okay, um, yes, she has good reason to be this unwell because of her advanced cancer, but something changed very acutely. If this was my sister, I would do some blood tests because there may be something to reverse. We did the blood tests and her calcium was 4.5. This is more than two and a half times the upper limit of normal. High calcium makes you miserably unwell. So I took some blood. We did the blood test. Calcium was very, very high. I stayed a couple of hours later. I squeezed the bags of fluid into her myself. Then I gave her some bisphosphonate. 48 hours later, there was no confusion. And she walked out of the hospice and lived for two, two and a half more months. So not because I'm a special doctor. Um, palliative care requires you to be really, really particular about what is going on. So yes, this lady was very much approaching the end of life, 
but something had changed very acutely. So it's our job as doctors to figure out, is there something reversible? And if it's reversible, will it actually improve the patient's quality of life? In this case, I felt yes, there was a chance that we could make a difference. Yes, she still died, but actually she died at home, which is where she wanted. When her symptoms flared up again, what did we do? We gave her subcutaneous fluids at home and she was good. So there is no one size fits all for palliative and end of life care. Um, you do have to take a very, very pragmatic view. As the patient is deteriorating, everybody has already alluded to this, little bit and often as per patient requirement, preference and comfort. We are eating for enjoyment. We are not eating for nutritional reasons. It is important to say that as we come to the end of life, there will come a point at which patients stop eating completely. This is normal, absolutely normal, and it will happen to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to reduce the rate of enteral feeds and TPN for patients who are at the end of life, not always, but it's case by case basis. And while all of this is going on and you're doing all of that good work, yeah. if you don't reassure the family at the same time, uh, they will fight you. So you have to spend as much time with the patient's family as you do with the patient. So let's come back to our scenarios. Or a frail chap with advanced bowel cancer. Um, he's actually reasonably comfortable. This chap died a week and a half later. So in the end, um, well, before I tell you, well, what would you do? Would you feed this guy? Would you put a feeding tube into him? Would you start TPM? Who would do TPM? No, no, no one's brave. Okay. So we, we, we didn't. We, we didn't give him TPN. We didn't put an NG tube in uh, because, interestingly, uh, a niece or grand niece, some distant relative, was a medical student and said, when we spoke to him, when his cancer therapy stopped, he very clearly said to all of us, don't put a feeding tube into me. When my time comes, let me go peacefully. We gave him a little bit of fluid to see. He, 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 there was no problems with his heart, so we could give a little bit of fluid to see whether he perked up. He didn't. We stopped it, and he died very peacefully, and the family were okay with that. It doesn't always happen, but we spent huge amounts of time with the family. Uh, this lady uh, with the very, very advanced dementia, um, a feeding tube was put to her. Um, and 48 hours later, she aspirated and died. Now, I did say to the family, if this was my grandmother, I would not put a feeding tube into her because there was a very, very clear trajectory of what was going on. This was absolutely clearly physiological, normal dying. Extra feeding would not have helped. And you had to subject her to anesthetic. You had to subject her to the risk of a procedure. And the outcome would be the same. And the family's response was, yes, but we felt like we did everything. So this has now become about the family, not about the patient anymore. And this is why we have to spend a huge amount of time educating family members. That I, I, I know it feels difficult and you feel helpless. But when you cross that line, it, it becomes a selfish exercise. You're not doing the right thing for the patient. You're simply making yourself feel better. If you have a good relationship with the family up to this point, you can say these things in a very gentle, empathic way. But if you've never met this family before, trying to have these conversations when that loved one is all, almost dying is very difficult, which is why you need to refer to palliative care at a much earlier stage. And then my favorite scenario, what did we do for this chap? Um, literally, if he walked in at the time I met him, you would not know that he had an advanced cancer. So what we did with this chap, um, we kept the venting gastrostomy in, which is essentially a peg tube in the, in the stomach that allows the proximal GI secretions to drain away. And then we put a more distal feeding tube into the small bowel, and he lived for another eight months at home. So, you know, everyone said to me, why, why is palliative care uh, pushing for artificial feeding? Because this guy wasn't dying imminently. He wasn't at the end of life. I don't know how long he had left to live, but he was functioning well. That's the thing. That's the one single thing that you have to assess in patients. What is their previous level of normal function? This is why the oncologists say when we're deciding whether somebody's fit enough for treatment, you know, what's your day like? Uh, are you asleep most of the day or are you up and about doing and living life? If you're not, 
if you have to be brought to the chemotherapy center in a stretcher, you're not fit enough for chemotherapy. So knowing what that patient's baseline level of function is allows you to do the right thing. So we supported this guy and actually uh, we've had quite a few patients like this and they all uh, went home again with feeding tubes. Uh, and it was important because we, and how old were the kids? The kids were, the youngest was five, so the others were old enough, they were over seven, eight, nine, something like that. So they were old enough to know the difference between alive and dead. They were old enough to know the difference that sometimes like a plate, if something falls and it breaks, you might be able to fix it. But in dad's case, we were not able to fix it. So we try to patch it up as much as we can. So these are the sorts of conversations we have to have. Um, end of life care is a very, very difficult time for people because uh, none of us thinks this is going to happen to us. So no matter how much you prepare, it's always a shock. You know, I'm always erring on the side of humility. I, I'm only, what am I now, 47 this year. Most of my patients are 15, 20 years older than me. But increasingly, we are seeing a lot of younger patients. A couple of weeks ago in our tumor MDT, uh, half the patients were under the age of 45 with cancer. What am I going to do when I'm the patient in the bed? You know, what am I going to want? And I don't know, I may be the worst patient ever. And I apologize if any of you look after me when I'm dying. Um, but I, I do what I do and I, I make a real point about it because you know, we do things and we care for patients because we're hoping that actually when our turn comes, somebody does the right thing for us. Mm. You know, yes, we, we are all professionals, but we're human first. So when we're teaching doctors and we're teaching medical students, you know, what I want them to be able to do is to be able to communicate with that person in the bed. You know, and you see it a lot. I said, well, introduce yourself. I'm doctor. No, no, no. You weren't born a doctor. What's your name? What do your mom and dad call you? Human first, clinician second. So it's about that communication. So this is what we do. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, dealing with huge amounts of distress. Um, and at the end of the day, we cannot force patients, can't, yeah, you can't force patients and families to do something. You can only offer advice. And one of my colleagues said to me, you have to bear in mind if, if somebody's had a long treatment journey and palliative care turns up at the very end of that journey, you know, you're, you're just a guest at the very end. You know, you're only able to impact at that point. So sometimes people take our advice, sometimes people don't. And when they don't, um, nine times out of 10, uh, it causes problems for the patient. Um, and families do come back and said, we should have listened. Now that's not wasted because the next time there's a family member who's in that scenario, we'll have somebody who can speak up for the patient, not simply speaking up for the grief of the family members. So I'm gonna shut up now because I'm over the time limit. Thank you very much. Uh, now for the Q and A uh, session. Um, do we have any questions before I bring them up? Everybody wants to go home. Do you all want to go home? <laughs> Well, I don't think so. There are any more questions? Want Everybody wants to go home. Well done. Thank you very much for the wonderful session. Okay, so before we wrap up, we just have a very short poster presentation of the top posters that have been chosen. Uh, there will be three posters presenting. I promise they are very short. Uh, the first presenter will be. Athir Ahmed, a master's student at King Faisal University, Department of Food and Nutrition College of Medical Sciences. Um, her paper is about the first international conference of food security and preserving biodiversity techniques and solutions at King Faisal University. 
sustainable life became prosperous. She has participated in voluntary programs with a rate of 403 hours in Al Ahsa hospitals, worked as a dietitian for two years, and has many developmental courses, such as HACCP, ISO, and clinical nutrition in hospital computer and secretarial diploma. Is she there you are. So my study, it's about the impact of high fat ketogenic diet and low fat diet in the body weight and cardiovascular risk factors in overweight and obesity Saudi women, uh, randomized control tra trailer. So as we know, keto diet is dependent of high fat and limited of uh, fat and uh, high fat, high fat uh, saturated fatty acids. So uh, the aim of this study is uh, investigated uh, the effect of high fat ketogenic diet and weight reduction compared to the low fat diet among Saudi overweight and obese women and cardiovascular risk factors. So micronutrients in high fat, it's the highest of uh, percentage, uh, 70%. Uh, and low fat diet, the high fat, the highest is uh, 55 uh, percentage in carbs. So this is method, age between 18 to 14, gender women, BMI between 25 to 34.6 during 12 weeks, and Al-Ahsa, only uh, physical activity steps uh, from uh, 7,500 7, to uh, 9,999. The symbol is 28. The low fat diet it's uh, in uh, 14, high fat diet, high fat uh, uh, 14. A picture showing uh, meals during 12 weeks for some volunteers. This is uh, the pictures. They're sent to me every uh, single uh, day. Um, the strips uh, special for the strips is uh, special for uh, ketogenic diet. If, uh, are they in, ketos in ketosis or not? Pictures showing uh, meals during 12 weeks for some volunteers about low fat diet. They sent to me also steps and uh, meals. Um, and this is weight during 12 weeks before it's 75, it's for high fat. After uh, 12 weeks, uh, 62, almost, uh, she lost almost uh, 13 or 14 weights, kilogram. A low fat diet, it's, um, before diet, it's 17 kilogram. After 12 weeks, it's uh, 65, almost uh, 10, uh, she lost uh, almost uh, 10 kilo, kilogram. This is the result, both of them of diets, weight and BMI, they're decreased before and after uh, for triglyceride, uh, for high fat, uh, decreased uh, of, of triglyceride, but in low fat diet, uh, it's uh, increased. And glucose, it's uh, increased, uh, decreased in uh, high fat, but in low fat diet, uh, the glucose uh, increased. So this is study on overweight and obese women how, who followed high uh, keto, showing a reduction in body weight and 
improved lipid profile after 12 weeks and has potential effect on decreased risk of cardiovascular. cardiovascular. This is our references. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Athir, for that very interesting presentation. Our next poster presenter. Our next poster presenter is Dr. Mays. Yes, Dr. Mays Mukayed. Uh, she is a clinical scientist and professor of health and life sciences at the American University in Dubai. As an educator and alumnus of Cambridge, Oxford, Stanford, Harvard, and Brunel universities, she banks 24 years of experience in clinical, molecular, and transactional research and education. She, has, she is a published author, reviewer, and an editor in cardiometabolic diseases, nutrition, cancer, vitamin D, biology, stem cell biology, and fetal maternal health. She is a member of the Biochemical Society, the Emirates Medical Association, the Endocrine Society, the NNED Pro Global Institute for Food, Nutrition and Health, and the Federation of the European Biochemical Societies. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, is there a question? Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm told by the organizers I have five minutes to actually give my message forward. Uh, my idea today is actually to start a dialogue about vitamin D and its importance. And uh, if I don't do service to it, I'm very happy to um, ask you to uh, download the paper which was just published yesterday in the Hot Topics of Current Nutrition Reports published by Spring and Nature. But the dialogue I'd, I'd like to uh, initiate is basically that Vitamin D3 sufficiency uh, may be, uh, be able to prevent, protect us from and mitigate risk and disease burden in acute and long uh, COVID-19. And while yes, we are very lucky, alhamdulillah, in the UAE not to have high cases anymore because the government has taken high uh, protection levels, this is still a very important global uh, case. And to date, the WHO reports that more than 765 million individuals uh, have been reported as positive cases and approximately now close to about 7 million people have died from this disease in a very short period of time. Uh, there's a huge economic and health toll on it, but why it continues to be a persistent problem is that it's not only the acute COVID that we saw so many deaths from a few years back, but it's the long COVID-19 symptoms that persist and are actually going to be a burden to healthcare with the costs of treatment. In the short term, of course, everybody experienced the huge toll of death, which was caused by the cytokine storm, a huge hyperinflammatory response by SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, major issues with blood pressure irregularities, lung fibrosis, and obviously the severe acute respiratory distress that we saw everybody um, mainly die from, that caused major lung fibrosis, pneumonia cases, and obviously eventual death. Now, the at-risk populations were those individuals with obesity. We saw many talks today about obesity. If you look at the UAE, we are at risk of obesity. Uh, indeed, we have huge prevalence here. Uh, if you look at women alone, it's 21%. If you look at the UAE Emirati indigenous population, it's about 39%. And if you look at the overall population, it's 17%. Now, it's a very high uh, prevalence that we need to really be mindful of. And we also have quite a lot of cases of diabetic patients pre-diabetic patients, both in the UAE and the GCC, and also, obviously, it's a global issue. Now, the acute phases did affect more the elderly um, and those at risk, but as I said, we have a, a greater risk with the fact that long COVID is more of a problem. Why? Because the, the virus is actually able to affect almost every single organ system that we have in our bodies. It is causing quite a lot of uh, symptoms such as fatigue, weakness, sarcopenia, 
uh, dyspnea. And now we also have a new onset type of diabetes, which is mirroring type 1 diabetes that is actually going to have added an extra burden of cost and care. But most importantly as well is that there have been quite a lot of brain deterioration disorders with a lot of people uh, presenting with, with cases such as headache, brain fog, loss of concentration, depression, attention disorders, and even uh, cases of stroke. And the virus actually can uh, transverse many tissues and endothelial layers. Uh, we've even seen in the beginning of the pandemic, we thought that you know the fetuses of pregnant women were, were okay. Now there's evidence showing that actually uh, traverses the placenta, goes in, and actually it can be seen in fetal samples. So it's a really major issue because this virus, while alhamdulillah, we do not have the severe cases, we do have the major issue with long COVID. And given that the ACE2 receptor, although there have been non-ACE receptor uh, infection possibilities with the virus, it really can hit any organ system and it has repercussions that we don't even know about. So are there risk factor populations? The answer is still age is an issue, but now, we see that with the long COVID, it affects middle-aged people as well, even younger people. It is not just the elderly, which is a subset. It affects people, particularly women. This is a major uh, issue. And it affects uh, immunocompromised sufferers, anybody with any kind of immunocompromisation for whatever the reason is. And um, it, it does actually still pose a burden to healthcare and the cost of healthcare and obviously to patient care. So uh, what I want to do today is actually start the dialogue and prime really the dialogue for us to rethink again this problem. SARS-CoV-2 consistently persists to be a problem. While we don't see the acute cases, we see the long COVID issues. SARS-CoV-2 is not just our own problem. We've seen resurgence of monkeypox virus in a much higher infectivity. We've seen Marburg come back. This is an Ebola, uh, uh, you know, a part of the Ebola family. And even COVID itself, we've seen now a highly infective uh, strain, the Arcturus COVID-19 that we've heard about now hitting Australia. Uh, uh, so even though it's not at our border, it's still a problem we need to be uh, careful. So we actually still need a public health measure that is cost effective. Uh, that we're not rushing right at the end to actually solve something and, and you know, uh, uh, affect an emergency in a kind of random way. But we need pre-planning. We need a public health measure which can actually uh, combat all of these, prime people's immune systems, improve people's health uh, as a whole. And we need to find a biological agent which has this omnipotent, diverse biological effect, just as the virus itself is, a multi, is, is able to affect multi-organ systems. So we need an agent that could tackle also the uh, comorbidities, the risk factors, which I already said that things like diabetes, obesity, um, uh, blood pressure issues, uh, all these issues that are comorbidities that increase the risk of both infection and, and uh, mortality, uh, we need an agent that is able somehow to be able to mitigate all the risk risks. And guess what I'm proposing is vitamin D3, but why? Very simply, I'm sitting with nutritionists and health practitioners. Vitamin D uh, has autocrine, paracrine um, uh, issues and uh, uh, you know effects and endocrine effects as well. So I'm trying to uh, keep the time. So it is something that we can get daily from sunlight exposure. And half the exposure gives us, uh, so half body exposure for about 15 minutes, about 30 minutes, gives us about 10,000 international units or the equivalent of 250 micrograms to about 20,000 IUs, depending which time of the day uh, you have exposed yourself. Now, the Institute of Medicine, which is one of the global authorities that gives recommendations on doses, uh, recommends about 600 IUs per day, which in my personal opinion, and I'll show you very much why, is exceptionally conservative. Now, over the years, there have been many debates from people like me who work in vitamin D, who've actually advocated for a higher level. And societies such as the Respected Endocrine Society, again, one of the exceptionally big names in endocrine and biochemical research, recommends at least 1,500 to 2,000 IUs, and even people can take up to 4,000 IUs safely, which is international units, and even a, a, a recommends an upper tolerable uh, or upper tolerance level of 10,000 IUs. Now, again, remember, we are a population that has obesity, which is very high prevalence in the UAE. 
And there is something called volumetric dilution in the administration of vitamin D on people who are obese. If you are obese, you actually need higher doses because your fat cells actually have an absorptive effect and a storage effect and an inactivation effect. So the biology of vitamin D metabolism is actually very interesting in fat cells. So it's very important for us to always have a sufficiency level, which is about 30 nanograms per mil of vitamin D and more if we can. And that really needs to be looked at in different kinds of randomized control trials and studies and even guideline recommendations for countries in terms of the administration. Now, what, as I said, it's not about showing empirical data here, but more kind of sum, summing the data that has been out there and that is continuously supporting this argument. If you do a very simple PubMed search, you'll find that there are about 1,607 papers that show the associations of study and examine the associations between vitamin D3 and COVID-19 outcomes. There are about 27,000 plus papers that look at the multi-organ system benefits of vitamin D beyond skeletal health. When I was a young student at 20, I was working on vitamin D, but I was working on bone and ossification. And those, there was always vitamin D in bone. Several years later, it, there are just, you know, studies about vitamin D effects and benefits on every single organ system in your body. And I wish to stress, particularly for this audience, muscle and brain, and I will show you why. Of course, I will summarize the findings, uh, but of course, there are detailed studies you can refer to in either my paper or the paper of many other eminent uh, colleagues. What uh, I wish to summarize, really, one thing is that the vitamin D sufficiency before infection of any kind. Now, here we study SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, but before any of these viral infections, sufficiency levels of important prevention. Those that have deficiency or insufficiency in the vitamin D3 have a higher rate of infectivity as supported by almost every single paper I have for the last two years read about, um, you know, infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and hence COVID outcomes. So sufficiency is important. But sufficiency doesn't come by you taking vitamin D today. Sufficiency comes by having proper nutritional uh, uh, strategies for stratification of population, for a supplementation of populations with vitamin D and creating this sufficiency. Vitamin D3 supplementation when supplemented. So obviously in the past two years, so many people were trying so many emergency kinds of treatments until they kind of found the best treatment to deal with it and mitigate some of the, the disease uh, effects and complications that there were. But what supplementation does, it can mitigate COVID-19 <laughs> severity, morbidity and improve survival in all age groups. Definitely it does in the elderly. It does reduce time in hospitalization when many of these people have been hospitalized. It does lower inflammatory and coagulation markers, which tend to be actually the, the causes of most of the death for the acute cases. It does result in earlier discharge from hospital and therefore the cost for the health provider, for the governments is gonna be lower. And it does reduce symptoms, especially of long COVID, uh, as I will show you in a bit. The timing of administration seems to be important if you review the literature. As I said, I hope you can read it. I won't be long, two minutes. Uh, and and um, this needs to be is important in clinical considerations because if you want to act, you need to act early. Later on, in a severely complicated case, this will actually not work. And I have not really been convinced by any of the data that it will. In patients with obesity, this has to be taken care of that there is a secondary factor now playing in the role of how the clinical treatment supplementation needs to be. Now here I very much summarize because I see Dr. Alia here. The fact that if you look at the scientific literature, I'm a clinical scientist, I work with, in, you know, with, with empirical data. Vitamin D has anti-inflammatory effects, modulates immune systems, uh, it improves brain function, it does improve muscle regeneration for a, stem cell recruitment by mitochondrial function and has been shown actually to promote muscle uh, uh, build and regeneration. And it does affect uh, comorbidities by reducing or medicating the risk of these, which I said, obesity, diabetes. Again, I refer you to another paper I published on the effects of vitamin D on cardiometabolic health and supplementing with vitamin D, having you know, vitamin D3 sufficiency does improve and uh, all these factors improves insulin sensitivity, it actually modulates hypertension, and it does actually have an effect on many of the circulating hormones associated with cardiometabolic disease. 
the recommendations to uh, to uh, put forward for you uh, a dialogue with physicians, nutritionists, etc., is we need to consider vitamin D3 as a cost-effective way to actually supplement uh, uh, individuals to look at it as an omnipotent biological agent to improve COVID-19 outcomes. It could not just be SARS-CoV-2. We may have many more viruses to deal with in the future. So this vitamin D3 supplementation needs to be looked at as a strategy to improve overall public health of people. High doses need to be investigated. Now, I showed you the IOM recommendations. And for clinicians, for people who make decisions about doses, this is very important. The IOM gives us conservative 600 IUs. You get from 15 minutes exposure in sunlight, 10,000 to 20,000 IUs, depending what time of day you go, how much of your body, it's a half body exposure you can expose. If you eat fish, a piece of fish alone will have about 400 to 500 IUs. So surely having higher doses should be tested. I wouldn't say immediately recommend, but you need to test it in randomized controlled trials to show its efficacy. Certainly in the doses, as the studies that I have shown and reviewed, uh, doses after 200,000 IUs were being used, and there was no toxicity, there was no side effect. Indeed, any of you who's a primary care physician, a GP or so on, you know that for people like psoriasis patients, for uh, many other patients, MS patients, multiple sclerosis, etc., the doses are much higher. So why this conservative uh, lower effect? We need to do the studies. We need to actually be the brave people who start studies to show that we need higher levels to actually implement uh, health outcome, which is beneficial. Last but not least, I recommend research, research into uh, uh, the effects here, but at higher doses, the different timing uh, to improve immunological response and actually to reduce comorbidities. And, you know, the take home message here is prevention is certainly better than cure. If we start and we build kind of sufficiency, vitamin D3 sufficiency in our populations, we actually may be preventing much of the hassle complication costs of much disease. Uh, with these recommendations, uh, please read those papers. And as I said, either please feel free to email me and or kindly you know, download the paper, read it, cite it, and please share your comments about your recommendations and hopefully start the dialogue for creating a population which has vitamin D3 sufficiency as a preventive measure against COVID-19 and any other new emergent viruses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mais. Our last presenter, Atman Gattar, is a Saudi Arabian PhD student in clinical nutrition at UM, UPM, originally from the southern region of Jazan. With experience in clinical dietetics, management, and private practice, he currently works in nutrition administration in Jazan. He has strong research potential and actively contributes to research project goals. With a talent for guiding all aspects of research studies, from analysis to reporting, he also possesses a good standard of written English. This presentation will be virtual. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in this world. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Othman Qatar, and I'm pleased to be here virtually to present my research on the effects of ketogenic diet on oxidative stress and cancer. I'm a PhD student in the field of clinical nutrition at UVM, a senior clinical uh, dietitian in Ministry of Health, Jazz and Saudi Arabia. I'm excited today to share my findings with you and engage in some meaningful discussion about this important topic. So, uh, cancer is. Um, Complex and multi-phase disease that remains one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Where the high glucose uptake and glucolysis levels in cancer cells are some of the characteristics that enable them to meet their high energy demands. However, this reliance on glucose metabolism also leads to increased oxidative stress that can damage um, cells and promote um, cancer uh, progression. As researchers continue to, research, to investigate potential treatments and prevent measures, the role of diet in cancer development and progression has garnered significant attention nowadays. Among the dietary interventions that have emerged as a potential tool in cancer management, 
is a ketogenic diet, which is a high fat, low carbohydrate and a moderate protein diet that forces the body to switch from glucose metabolism to fatty acid metabolism, leading to the production of ketone bodies that are more efficient source of energy than uh, glucose. So in this slide, I'm trying to show that how ketone bodies convert fewer NAD molecules to NAD DH for energy generation than uh, glucose, allowing for free NAD uh, molecules to be used for various activities, such as cellular health and metabolic uh, therapy. So ketogenic diet has gained attention as a potential intervention in cancer management due to its ability to reduce oxidative stress and modu modulate cancer progression. In this review, um, which aims to uh, provide a comprehensive analysis um, of the current literature on the effects of ketogenic diet on oxidative stress and cancer, to examine the underlying mechanism and drawing conclusions based on the available evidence. Um, we identified the relevant studies that has been published in the last 10 years. Systematic search was conducted using various databases to come up with um, um, certain papers or articles that is related to, um, uh, to the topic itself. Two researchers independently performed the data extraction, quality assessment, and all um, uh, search um, process using the uh, Prisma um, chart as displayed the study um, selection process. And finally, we came up with 10 articles that is qualified for the review and were included in the qualitative synthesis. And the review found that uh, ketone, uh, keto uh, diet has several potential benefits in reducing stress and modulating cancer progression. So uh, in our results, we found that ketogenic diets reduces oxidative stress. Some studies have demonstrated that ketogenic diet decreases reactive oxygen uh, species production and increases antioxidant defenses in cancer cells and animal models such as glution and catalyst. Ketogenic diets also alters cancer cell metabolism by switching from uh, glucose and uh, oh, sorry, glucose metabolism to fatty acid uh, metabolism induced by ketogenic diets that appears to diminish the availability of substrates for the production of um, reactive oxygen species, thereby reducing the oxidative stress as a consequence. Moreover, the ketogenic diet inhibits cancer cell proliferation and induces apoptosis as a number of studies reported that ketogenic diets leads to cancer cell arrest, decreased proliferation, um, and increased apoptosis in various cancer uh, types, potentially lead or due to the um, reduced availability of energy substrates and increased oxidative stress. And finally, um, ketogenic diet in, in enhances the efficacy of um, cancer therapies, as some studies uh, demonstrated that ketogenic diets can improve the effectiveness of conventional uh, treatments as uh, chemotherapy um, or radio radiotherapy and it enhances the anti-tumor effects of um, novel therapies such as targeted therapies and uh, immunotherapies. So the current literature supports the notion that uh, ketogenic diet um, can reduce oxidative stress and exert anti-tumor effects through multiple mechanisms. By limiting glucose availability, ketogenic diets forces cancer cells to switch to a less efficient energy pathway, thereby, um, thereby hindering, um, hindering their growth and uh, proliferation. Additionally, the reduction in um, reactive oxidative stress uh, production and enhancements of um, anti-cancer defenses contribute to the overall anti-tumor effects of ketogenic diet. However, despite these uh, promising findings, there are several uh, limitations to consider, as most studies to date have been conducted in preclinical uh, models, and the results may not be accurately reflect the effects of ketogenic diets in humans. However, further um, 
the anti uh, the optimal uh, ketogenic diet compositions and duration for cancer therapy remain unclear and potential side effects need to be uh, carefully weighted against the potential benefits so to conclude or to come up with the final uh, say studies demonstrated substantial um, evidence supporting the potential benefits of ketogenic diets in reducing oxidative stress and uh, modulating cancer progression However, for the research, particularly uh, uh, randomized clinical trials, it is necessary to uh, elucidate the optimal ketogenic diet parameters and assess its long-term safety and efficacy in, in uh, cancer uh, patients. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you very much. Uh, those were very interesting uh, poster presentations. Uh, we will be calling now Dr. Moza Sharhan and the president of the uh, conference, uh, Ms. Muna Shammar, to present the certificates for the presenters. Uh, Ms. Athir Anobi. Is your first time presenting? She needs a big club. This is her first experience. And I can feel that she has a lot in her mind, but she was worried that we are, yeah, we are the first of many, inshallah. Dr. Mays Mukayed. I know Dr. Mays. She's a guru and she, you will see her everywhere in all the societies. I'm going to present a poster in your pathology. I will, because yes. in December, we want to see you all there, please. Inshallah. Thank you very much. And Have virtually, he will receive. Yes, he will be receiving his certificate. And congratulations for his PhD. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we hopefully to see you tomorrow, inshallah. And we will try to make it shorter than today. Thank you. Have a great day.